Tonight we are at step 10, in which we continue to take a personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. And as we begin step 10, we finished last week at 9, we are now going into the fourth dimension of life, uh, which many of us never knew existed. I think that's one of the miracles of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, our program is not a program of, uh, as what most of us perceive of it, a program not to drink. It's a program how to live where it won't be necessary that we drink. Uh, you know, any alcoholic can stop drinking, but the problem is how to live. Yeah. Uh, well, a great friend of mine says it's, it's uh, in fact, every alcoholic is going to stop drinking. It's just good to be alive when you stop, you know. <laughs> but to get to that point, we begin at, at step one to get to step ten. And the first step in recovery, and we said in our steps we're going to go through these three phases. What is the problem? And in the first step we find out what the problem is. And this is the first step to recovery is to understand what's going on in your life. And it was said another night in our meetings that probably 95 out of every 100 alcoholics will die never knowing what the problem is in their life. <coughs> uh, most of them out there in the graveyard still think it's their wives. <laughs> or their job, you know. Or the, like me, I, I, I laid it on everything. I got to a point in my life where I thought it was the ice. <laughs> you know, I really didn't know what the problem was. Until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and from some people who had solved their problems. It was from them that they gave me, and they passed this on from the first 40 people on down to me. So I feel very blessed that I, understand, I am an alcoholic. Not only that I am an alcoholic, but I understand what the problem was in my life. And of course I found out that the problem is simple. It's a twofold problem. Part of it is in my body and part of it is in my mind. I have an a allergy to alcohol. Um, that is to say I have an abnormal, there's an, something, ab, something occurs in me that doesn't occur in the average tempered drinker. When I, take an al when I take a drink of alcohol, I experience a phenomenon of crave. I crave alcohol. Once I take a drink, I crave alcohol, and immediately I want another drink, and that drink wants another drink, and that drink wants another drink, and another drink, and that's abnormal. Normal people don't do that. They, they may or may not take another one. Uh, most of them take one, and then they'll shake it and walk around for a while, and that's the normal way to drink. But I never did drink that way. I was an abnormal drinker. And they would walk around and they may or may not take another drink. And if they drank two or three real quick like me, they would get sick and vomit. They'd, you know, they couldn't handle it that way. And I remember those normal drinkers, they used to always tell me, just take two or three and stop. Well, it's okay if you know how to do that. They was trying to tell me to do something that I didn't understand. When I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I realize that I, I'm an abnormal, something occurs in my body physical allergy that does not occur in the average tempered drinker. And once I take a drink, I experience this craving and I continue to drink and I go through the well-known spree. And I emerge remorseful with a firm resolution, quite naturally anybody would, it would be firm. If you got sick as we would, you would have a resolution not to drink again. You know, that's probably a good symptom of alcoholism. Anybody who says, I'm not going to ever drink anything at it again. He's probably an alcoholic. Now, the only thing that we suggest here is entire abstinence. If you don't take the first drink, you don't have, never have to experience this. And this is real simple. Now, this is just half of my problem. The, the fact that I can't drink alcohol is just part of my problem. The main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than the body. Why do we take the first drink? Anyway. And he says we become restless and nervous and discontent. We become lonely and then we get bored and, and uh, we have all these different emotional things that seem to build up on us. And once these things build up on us, we, 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 we remember 
the sense and ease and comfort that would come at once if we take a few drinks of alcohol. So this, as this idea is triggered, this obsession is triggered, the obsession, the idea to drink and depress this pain overcomes all other ideas. It overcomes the remembrance of the, of the last drinking occasions. It pushes this back into our minds. And then the only, only thing that we can see is, uh, is think about the relief we're going to get. And this obsession makes us reach over and take a drink, and that drink sends off the craving in the body, and we go through the well-known spree. And Dr. Doctor said in the first step that this, is, this thing goes over and over again. And unless we can see and understand the problem, we're a victim of, of this condition, the mind triggering the body and the body in reverse triggering the mind. <coughs> but once we, we, we understand these two factors of the physical problem and the mental obsession, the physical allergy, the mental obsession, when we understand and see these things, we realize that we are powerless over alcohol. We can't drink it and we can't leave it alone. Therefore, we're powerless. So once we see the problem, then we can determine a solution. Simple process. Write the prescription. Once the doctor uh, identifies, he makes a diagnosis, then he writes the prescription. If you're powerless, your prescription is power. Power greater than yourself, obviously. And you would like for this power, since we can't work in the body, we don't know anything about the allergy. We believe that the power would have to work in the mind. Therefore, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So really, the first two steps, we, we have the foundation. We got the two conclusions that put us in a position for the treatment plan. You know, we got the, you know, got the problem, we got the answer. Now we've got to carry out the plan of action. And the next thing it comes to is the, if you're powerless and the solution is power, then steps three through 12 is a plan how to find that power. And we begin in step three with this little program of plan, program of action. Because there's no action in these two steps. The action begins in these next working steps of the program. We begin in step three. Step three says make a decision. Which one do we want? And quite obviously, I think, you know, it's a real easy decision <laughs> between these two. Uh, we don't want to go back to this way. No alcoholic likes this. And uh, really, most alcoholics, if you're new in the program, they don't like the solution. I mean, it's pretty, you know, but it's not a tough decision between the two. I'm mean, thinking everybody, if they could get the first two steps, would choose the second step. They would choose the power. And if we make this choice, then this decision involves, uh, we, we choose this. And if we do this, we have to, uh, to, in order to have this power, if God's going to direct our lives, there are certain things that we have to get self out of the way. So we make a decision to turn our will and our lives to the care of God as we understand it. And therefore, God is going to become the director of our lives. And this is a, a, a tough choice for, at the new, for the new alcoholic at this point. It was tough for all of us. Well, once we make this decision, then we have to go to work to clear away the things that block us from this decision. You know, we alcoholics, uh, we have a lot of things going on. There's no way God can carry out this decision in our lives. You know, I... I uh, uh, you know, we, we alcoholics, we can, we all, we make a lot of bargains with God. You know, I used to say, God, if you do this, I'll do that. You know, but I never really made this decision. I, I made a lot of deals with him, and I told him what I was going to do, and all these different things. And nothing ever did ever happen in my life. You know, these, these things did not work. You know, I think... This brings to mind one of my favorite stories. This is quite a spiritual story. But this guy was out one morning. He was out. To, he had he somewhat had changed his life and got into helping people and in the in the in the big big book. And he had going around talking to people. 
and he had, uh, but he liked to play golf occasionally, and he was out with one of his friends playing golf one day, and uh, he hit the ball, and it kind of curved and run over in the water, and before he could catch himself, he said, oh, shit. <laughs> and this other guy said, Reverend, I, I have never heard you say anything like that. He said, that's just not like you. He said, well, he said, that comes from my old life. Uh, when I, and then when I played golf, and I just, I just I never been able to, I, I never would say nothing like that, except when I'm playing golf, I have a problem with it. He said, well, I'd be careful with that because it's lightning and thunder out here, and I think, I'm just scared out here with you talking like that and the lightning and thunder. <laughs> so they played on down a little further, and he hit another ball. And it curved and went over and the he said, oh, shit. And he said, oh, man, don't say that. He said, I'm scared out here. It's lightning and thunder and something might strike you. He played down a little further. He hit another ball and it went off. And he said, oh, shit. And a big clap of lightning and thunder come out and bang, hit both of them. And when the smoke cleared, the other guy was gone. And a big voice come out of heaven and said, oh, shit. <laughs> but you know what? Do we? That's real spiritual, isn't it? <laughs> but when we... Uh, we look at these two alternatives and, you know, how can, we, we have to start off where we are in this program, you know, experimenting, we came to believe, and if we come to believe, we start using our concept of God. You know, it's an experience. You know, it's an, you know we don't use our, we use whatever understanding we are to begin to grow. It's something it's that we have to experience. And we begin at step three, and to carry this out, we, are, we really are blocked off from God. Maybe that's sometimes we really, we agnostic, we think maybe God does or does not exist. Because in our total being, in our way of living, we, we feel that there is no God. Because we have totally, the things within us have totally blocked us off from any use of this thing. So to us, this, way it, this is the way it appears. So the only way we can carry out this decision is clear away to the things that block us off. In the fourth step, we go into the process of identifying, not only identifying, but to list and analyze the things within us that block us off from God. You know, the number one thing we talked about in step four, we found out that resentments was the number one offender. There's no way that God can work through and direct a mind that's full of resentments. And we alcoholics, we talked about resentments and self-pity, how they dominate us, and, and, and these things insist upon ruling our lives, cut us off in the sunlight of the spirit, and we drink. So in step four, we, we finally got all this garbage down on paper. We got our resentments down. We got down the causes of them. We got down which parts of self was involved. We identify what was within our character that really allowed these things to come in. It wasn't what other people did. It was how we reacted to what we have. We cannot control other people. But if we are spiritually well, then what, we will not react to what they do. And they will not enter and dominate our lives. And we went for the first time, we listed and went through these things and analyzed and, and saw the real, <coughs> as the word says, a moral inventory we saw the real truth of these things in our life for the first time. <clears throat> and then in step five, we talked to another human being about them. In four, we identified <clears throat> and analyzed them. In five, we talked to another human being about them. We brought these things out into the open. By talking to another human being who was not involved in these things, we got still to the exact nature of the wrong. Looking mostly at the character defects in these discussions, and looking mostly also at which itself. We discussed these things with other human beings, and they corrected some of them. They improved on the information that we ourselves found in the inventory. 
And after seeing and evaluating and, and seeing the destruction in step four, seeing how they cut us off from the spirit and how useless they were, and then discussing it with another human being. Then in step six, we become willing to let go of these things. You know, these steps prepare us for step six. And once we become willing to let go of them, then in step seven, we ask God to remove them. We can see how one step opens up the next step. A process of elimination. We don't have to get anything. It's a process of removing the things from us that block us off from the decision in step three. And then this brings us to steps eight and nine. And we, as we go through the steps, we said that uh, steps three dealt based on one and two. We take three, which puts the center in our lives. And then in steps four, five, six, and seven, we work on our minds. And then we said the outermost area of life is our physiological, sociological lives. It was, we did clear that up with step eight and nine, our relationship with other people. And that's what life is. Life is about God, ourselves, which is our minds, and others. And once we make these amends, set right the wrongs, and our, our book tells us in step eight, we make a list, in step nine, and, and then we become willing to the list, in step nine, we go out and make these amends wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And at that point, we have put, when we complete steps eight and nine, we have put our, really, if all, all these are three dimensions of life, one, two, three, are in order, and then we saw twice in the big book he talks about a fourth dimension of existence. And, and we have the tools to live by. The tools for successful living. And I think, you know, we talk too much around Alcoholics Anonymous about not drinking. And we should talk about being successful in our careers, in, our, in everything we financially, in everything we do. We should talk about the, those things in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, the, 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 they're beyond your imagination. If you knew here tonight, you know, I know how you feel. Oh, I've got to go down there. I've got to stop drinking. I ain't going to never have no more fun. Well, you ain't really having fun now. <laughs> but you don't know that. <laughs> because that's normal to you. <laughs> but it really ain't fun. But we have now, you know, if we have worked these first nine steps, now it's all about a continuous way to grow. You know, and I hear a lot of people have, over the years, they have, they have said something like this is a maintenance step, you know, to maintain this circle. But I like to feel that, I think our book says that this is growth, continuous growth for the rest of our lives. And there's two things you can do in life. You can either, they say, grow or go. You know, you watch a tree grow, and I, I, love, I watch anything that God creates. And you watch a tree, I never see a tree or anything that's alive stop growing. It will grow continuously as long as it is alive. And when it stops growing, it starts dying. There seem to be two things in life, growing and dying. And if you ain't growing, you're dying. And if you're not dying, you're growing. So we don't, that's about you. Just really can't maintain as is. You can't maintain anything. You know, we see a piece of steel, and we see you know, or something, or this is made out of concrete or marble, and we go by and look at it, and, and we can, it looks like it's in a permanent state, but it's really deteriorating. It's getting. You no, know, you might not see the complete deterioration. We're just like this building. We can spend a lot of money maintaining this building, which we do. And regardless of how much we spend, one of these days, something else is going to be here. They're going to tear it down. And we can't maintain anything like the human life. The human life is a very complicated 
we are the most complicated, we've got God's greatest creation. Now we marvel at the rockets, we marvel at all the things that man creates, but we are the greatest gadget on the face of this earth. There is nothing as marvelous as we are. We have a fantastic mind, fantastic body. Yeah. Now, so life is unlimited. Once we learn the principles of living, and basically we've learned this in the first nine steps. Now it's how to go on and, and how to grow for the rest of our lives. There really isn't anything really. If these nine steps have, have uh, developed our, our lives at this point, then these are probably going to be, these are, there's not anything going to be really new here from now on out. The other growth is going to come by our ability to reapply these steps to our lives. How do we work with these simple tools we have used so far? It's just reapplying these simple tools every day throughout our lives. And step 10 is, it teaches us how to do that. Now, after we have finished the promises and the promises we read and after the promises, after the, uh, talks about all the great things, you know, after the first nine steps, no matter how far down the scale we've gone, we'll see that we can, our experience can benefit others. It talks about we will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. We will have a new freedom. All these promises come after the first nine steps. Now, after we have those promises, our book says, this step brings, this brings us to step 10. And so step, step 10 suggests we can continue to take a personal inventory and write any mistakes as we go along. And immediately we see that word inventory again, and you know, and I think that we have to, it says, and we took one inventory in step four, and it, it was, had some adjectives on it. It says, a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And now, here in step 10, he talks about a personal inventory. That means an inventory of a total person. And if we have worked these nine steps and learned the, the principles of, of human life, then we can see what a personal inventory details. A personal inventory would be an inventory of the total person. It would be an inventory of every facet of the human life. It would be an inventory of our spiritual well-being. It would be an inventory of our minds each day. It would be an inventory of our relationship with other people on a daily basis. Now, you know, you, if we, you know, one thing about taking the steps, we always talk about the mistake of, of taking the, the steps. A lot of people try to take the, the AA program off the wall. You know, you, they, they got the big book, and this is fine. This is a great thing to take the program out of the book. But most people read the step off the wall and interpret it off the wall and then try to take the steps as what they think it is. Now, you know, and they make it something else. They say, well, certain field in moral's inventory. But we get the idea that really means that just before you go to bed at night, uh, if you hurt anybody, uh, say a prayer about it, uh, do something. That's what I don't know. That, that, that seems to be the impression you get a step 10 off the wall. You know, it's one thing off the wall, but if you read it in the book, it's all together off the wall. Now, step you know, I really, I look at that, I look at that step, and it means just before you go to bed, if that was the case, uh, that would help me a lot, because I'm getting to the age now where I don't get in a lot of trouble in the bed anymore. Most of my trouble, <laughs> most of my trouble is in the, and walking around. You know, I, I really, I don't hurt too many people or get in squabbles in the bed. I was dangerous walking around in the daytime. You know what I mean? That's when I got into trouble. So it wouldn't, what's the advantage of straightening up everything, jumping in the bed? 
This is a positive step. It's a step that we work throughout each day. And if we work it as a big book, if we read it out of the big book, we'll find out it's altogether different than we interpret it. And this is why it's all, we always say work the steps out of the book. The big book of Alcoholics and Arms is the only book that gives us the instructions to take the 12 steps. Now why should we take it off the wall and leave the instructions in the book? You mean? Now if we read it out of the book, it means it says something different. We vigorously commence this way of living as we have cleaned up the past. We have cleaned up these things as best we can. They're not perfect. But for the first time, we got them into some, it says that it isn't in a few months. You know, we, we will find that we have gone and gone, some personality changes sufficient to recover. It didn't say that we perfect. But it says we don't, we should lose the obsession to drink here. You know, we got things rounded up pretty good. But I remember when I come to this place, I remember when I had the promises in my life. Felt better than I ever felt in my life. God, me. Woke up one day and I said, something, something. One day I was at work. And I've been going to them old dumb meetings, listening to all them dumb people. You know what I mean? Wasn't no big deal. I knew they couldn't help me. You know what I mean? Didn't have number one book in 12 steps. <laughs> and finally, doing all these things, I know it was stupid. You know what I mean? That wasn't going to work, going to all these silly meetings, hearing everybody's story over and over. And finally, one day I was at work, and uh, I said, Something, what is this going on in my life? For the first time in my life, I was able to comprehend the word serenity. Now, serenity, you have to experience. Your sponsor can't tell you what that is. You have to experience serenity to understand it. You have to experience freedom to know what freedom is. Because I, I used to walk around drunk thinking I was free. <laughs> I wasn't free, I was just loose. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I dawned on me that for the first time in my life I was I, I, something, I didn't know what it was. I, I couldn't, but this was the, these promises described it. You know, but nothing else describes it no be better than this. And it was the first time in my life I was able to experience this, as I know, this new freedom and this new happiness. And I could comprehend the word serenity, and I knew peace for the first time in my life. And I associated this feeling with serenity, and at that moment, for the first time, I was able to comprehend the word serenity. And I had, I said, what is this? I don't, it's going, I, I don't want to drink. And I, I couldn't, I, I didn't know when this happened. Over this period of time, it's what the book said, through part, the, following these steps, through this process, I, the obsession to drink was removed. It talks about it here. And he says, we go on, we have entered the world of spirit. Remember step two said, came to believe that Apollo greater than we disbelieved and they said we would take decisions, we took the actions. After step five, it says this was the beginning of, we are entering the spiritual experience. This is the beginning. And step 10 says, after we finish now, we have entered the world of the spirit. Now, uh, this is not, it's not an overnight matter. We should continue for a lifetime. And we in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a lifetime program. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Now, as you know, as we took the inventory, in what step, you know, what step did we do? What step did we look for those selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear? In what step did we look for those things, somebody? Step four. So in step four, that's where we started that process. Looking for those things. Selfishness and dishonesty were our character defects. Resentment and fear were the things that blocked us off from God. We did, so it says continue, really what he's saying, continue each day to take step four. 
When they crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. What steps did we do that in? Step six and seven. Step six and seven. So step 10 is step four and step six and seven. We discuss them with someone at meeting. <coughs> step five. So step 10 is four, five, six, and seven so far. Then we make amends quickly if we have harmed anybody. 89. So steps 10 is a, a working. We don't have to go back and make that decision. But each day we go back from that decision and work out in these two areas. And we can really, you know, this, we can see the possibilities of these steps. We ain't talking about maintaining. We're not talking about staying as you are. You know, we can challenge anybody in the room tonight to work these, these nine steps and go back each day and work steps four through nine in your life and remain exactly as you are. <laughs> totally impossible. Because as you work these steps over, as you take step four every day, you're going to discover other things in your life. And you know, as you talk them over to other people, you're going to learn more about yourself. And as you ask God to remove them, they're going to become less and less. And as you make amends, you're going to improve your relationship with other people. You're going to improve your mind. And you improve your relationship with other people. And you're going to remove more things out of these two areas that block you off from spiritual growth. And you're, going to, and you're going to grow spiritually and your life is going to get better. You will not remain the same. So step 10 is really is saying, hey man, these, these things that work that got us out of hell. <laughs> now let's work toward heaven. And, and our lives are unlimited. But they still yet limited to what we want to do. I think the greatest waste of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is maybe not the people out there who are still drinking. We always say they're going to die, right? But the greatest waste of Alcoholics Anonymous is those of us up in the program who are not finding these things. Come We're coming in and not drinking and talking about how long I've been sober. <clears throat> we see them around there, eh? Got all kinds of people around there. Some sober and happy, you know, some mediocre. Some say, I've been sober 25 or 30 years, and you want to buy them to drink, they're so damn mean, you know, mad. You, know. <laughs> you see them kind, you know, they're really sick, you know, bragging about how long they've been without a drink. There's nothing in this book. There's nothing, because we create those things. There's nothing in this big book that talks about the length of your sobriety. We created that. Nothing in the AA big book about how long you've been sober. There's a lot in this book about the quality of your life. Nothing about the quantity of your sobriety. See, those things distract us. What's important is what kind of quality have we got in our life? And we, have, we, we, can, we can grow and grow and grow as we continue to work the first nine steps each day. You know, uh, we watch for these things and throughout the day, you know, um, all through the day. You know, it didn't say, it, and it says continue, it didn't say here, don't say anything about once today either. <laughs> You know, we can say daily. Daily doesn't mean once a day. That means as needed. It says stop right then. You know what I mean? What is this? Remember, it ain't him. No way. It ain't them no more. Because I found that out in step four. When I listed and analyzed myself, I found out with honesty, the problem is never them anyway. The problem is me. Amen. 
the problem is always me. If, you, if the problem is you, remember we, we know a new freedom. And if you're a free person, the problem is you. When the problem is theirs, you have enslaved yourself. If it's them again, you have enslaved yourself. But the problem is always me because I'm a free man. What is within me that allows this to happen? Inventory it right away. See what it is. See what character defect. Maybe it's impatience. Maybe it's intolerance for somebody else. Maybe he was wrong. But what is within you that allowed this to hurt you? We're going to meet people wrong all day. <laughs> We're going to meet people with problems all day because they got self too. And boy, they got self too. And they're going to make mistakes. But it don't make no difference what they do. What is within me that allow me to have this resentment, a fear, is it selfishness? And look within myself when this happens. And I can see it right away. Right away. Because I'm a free person, I gotta look at me. Uh, and once I see it within me, I might need to discuss it with someone else. <clears throat> it might, might have to. Maybe I won't, maybe I can just see it myself. I can't see it within me. I discuss it with someone and help them to find this in me. <clears throat> then I, when I see that, I say, God, remove this. If I've harmed anyone, I, I apologize. You know, and I can do that. And you can work, these, work this little thing in about 10 or 15 minutes. And then you're free for the rest of the day. <laughs> you got a great day. You know, and this is an awesome responsibility, but it's really what we said, and it's an awesome responsibility. <clears throat> my happiness is always now at home. It's mine. You know, my happiness depends upon me, not upon what they do uh, to me, but how I respond to what they do. You know, when I remember in my early sobriety, I had hard troubles with these, and I had to, I had to develop little games for myself, you know, little, uh, I knew I had to have certain things I, to, to trigger trigger me into things. And I used to have a, you know, a little stop like in the mid-morning about, I do it in the morning when I got up, got my, I look at things, get things in some perspective as best I could. Long about coffee break time in the morning, 9.30 or 10, I stopped. And then noon, and then four o'clock in the evening. I had to have little things that I associated with time. And then, you know, I could get myself whatever, I could get, I found out I could get myself out of things. And my life didn't get so balled up. If I went, if I did it once a day, I'd, man, I'd be in a hell of a shape. I found I had to straighten my life out about every three or four hours. I had to bring it, get it, get it straightened out. And it seemed like I wasn't getting any better. I'd get myself out of something in the morning, and about three hours or noon, I'd say, hell, that's what we got out of this morning. You know what I mean? And I'd see how flaky I really was, you know what I mean? And, and my wife used to tell me sometime, you know, I'd do something. She said, I don't think you're getting no better. I said, I said the same damn thing. I ain't getting no better. <laughs> I breathe with her. <laughs> but the more I would do this, the more I learned about me. You know what I mean? I took, this is inventory, personal inventory. Learned about the business I was running. Learned about the stock in trade. You know? And the more I talk these things over with other people, you know, and it, it really got me, I got an ego. We all got an ego. And I was always going to my sponsor. And I'd talk these things, and, I, and then this got me. I said, damn, man, you know, this is, you, you're going to be talking to people the rest of your life. Ain't you going to never have no life? Three or four, five, six months, I'm going down. Yeah, I got this. And then I said, but look, if you would watch yourself a little more, Maybe you could catch these things earlier and you could deal with them before they got that bad. You have to grow. You can't go to your sponsor for the rest of your life. Now once we have uh, begun to learn this and begin to apply it to our lives, you know, these, as these character defects become less and less, other things begin to crop up. 
know, a lot of things we know we would take our inventory in the beginning and got some things we wanted to let go of. And uh, it, it's a painful to let go of these things because, you know, these kinds of effects, some of them, a lot of them are fun. <laughs> you know, a lot of them are fun. You know, th little things like criticism. You know, we all like that. We like to criticize another. You know, criticism, it seems to be, uh, it just goes around, you know. And uh, it's, a, it's a put down of another person, pointing out his weaknesses to build up my own self-esteem. Maybe I don't do that, right? Uh, and we all enjoy that. Some of these things are enjoyable. But as we begin to, our lives begin to get better and better, some of the things that, some of the character defects that we're able to hang on to, they're all right. They maybe don't get us drunk. Uh, they, they, they probably don't know big deals. But as your life gets better, these things don't fit in there. They fit in there. Today. But as your life gets better, some of these things don't fit in there as your life begins to grow. And none of us set out to become perfect. That was my greatest problem in AA. I said, this thing will make you too good. I don't like it, and I, I said, "Damn, man, I don't want to be that good." You know, what I mean? but you know, as we begin, this a kind of a uh, the goodness comes through in a, a a a reverse process. You know, we don't really set out for that, but the goodness in our lives comes as the result of willing to let go of these things a little bit at a time. And as well, as our life gets better, we look at these things and we say, "Well, this is not very good now." We wanted to hang on to that last year, but, you know, now, that don't go with my life. That don't go with my life. And as we practice this, you know, early detection is the name of the game. Like any other problem, the earlier we detect it, you know, the easier that and we can do it before it does less harm. So step 10 teaches us that, and it's something we have to practice. And we're going to make mistakes. We're going to hurt other people. We're going to be making a lot of amends for a while. And then later on, we'll be able to detect these things before they get that bad. Now, after we have worked step 10 for a while, we have some, another set of promises in the big book. We have a set of promises after step 10, just like we have a set of promises after step 9. We always talk about the promises on page uh, 83 and 84. We hear them talked about a lot. Um... But well, we don't talk a bunch about the promises on page 84 and 85. It's very peculiar. I, I don't get into specifically on these things. People, a lot of people, guys in the book, they want to look at things about how many promises. Some people say it's 11 or 12, but whatever it is, there's the same amount of same number of promises come after step 10 that come after step 9. Same number. Uh, we don't talk about those much. Now, after we work step 10, it says, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. Remember, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Sanity has returned. Sanity has returned. It came home. We're whole. A little piece came back. A little piece that I had where I couldn't make sane decisions about alcohol came back. After it comes back, look course what happens. We will be seldom interested in liquor. If tempted, we will call from it like a hot flame. We will react sanely. We are restored to sanity. And normally. We will see that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor had been given us, had been given, been given to us. What, without any thought or effort on our part, we didn't, we didn't work at this. What we did, we worked for something else. It just comes, that is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. See, that's the strange thing, that I haven't quit drinking. <laughs> I really haven't quit drinking. I, mean, 
I haven't found it necessary to take a drink. Every time I quit, it failed. So I don't want to go back to that. Instead, the problem has been removed. See, I don't have the problem anymore. I don't have to not drink. If you still have to not drink, you still have an alcoholic man. Because the problem has been removed. Remember back on page 45 when it says, you know, the, the main purpose of this book is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. That's the purpose of the whole thing. As we practice these steps, we said that we have, through the steps 3 through 12, now already we have found that power, and that power has removed the obsession to drink. It says, it, it does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. This is how we act as long as we keep in a fit spiritual condition. You know, we, we don't have to quit. We don't have to not drink anymore because we don't have anything in us, that obsession. We don't have to fight this obsession. Why? Because through the working of these steps, this power greater than ourselves has removed this obsession. And we don't have to not drink anymore. You know, this is what the new alcoholic can't understand. I remember when I first come to AA, I said, well, you know, I've got to quit drinking. I want to do that anyway. And I'll go down here and join this AA thing and be miserable with all them other people who had to quit like me. <laughs> so that's what I thought about it. You know, I thought maybe, you know, we sat around and talked about, boo, we can't drink. But we don't have the problem. If you're a new person, you know, if you didn't have this obsession, you know, now I can make sane decisions about drinking. Over the last, last uh, 24 years, I've never walked in a liquor store and, and uh, bought a drink. Never walked in a liquor store. Last, I've, I've had been able to make sane decisions about alcohol. One time in my life, I'd walk right in there and buy the same damn thing, thing that killed me three weeks ago. But I've been restored to sanity. I don't walk in there and say, hey, mister, I drank some of that 24 years ago. I'd like to damn near kill me, put me in a nut house. Lost my job. Lost my wife. Lost everything I own. Now, how much would you sell me another bottle of that? I want to buy some more. <laughs> I would have to be insane to do that. And I look at I have been restored to sanity. I look at it from a sane. And you really don't have to be a genius. A lot of times a friend of mine said, you don't have to be a genius to stay sober. You don't have to be a, you don't have to have a master's degree to stay sober. You don't have to have a college education. All you need is good common sense. That's all. Anytime an alcoholic picks up a drink, at that moment, he does not have good common sense. And that's what's saying. We have been restored to where I have good common sense toward alcohol. Now, it, this is, a, as we, we, we continue to work this throughout each day, and, and the degree of our progress really is, it's up to an individual. That's why we can't, all of us are individual people, individual personalities, individual problems. We can't compare ourselves, but it's based on what you do. It's based on how much work you put in. Uh, I see people who come into the program with good programs, good healthy programs, and they can make the progress what many people take them many years to make because they don't really work. It's what, it's what you put in it. It's the work on the individual basis. It has nothing to do with time. You can't compare yourself. So what the work how do you work on yourself? He says, it's easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. For we are headed trouble for alcohol is a subtle foe. You know, it's really hard, it's easy to work when you're new in the program. But sometimes most of us get real, get this thing off of our back and get all the things going good. And, and you know how we alcoholics like to do when we make success. Um, like the guy said, it's like the alcoholic dog when he got so when alcoholic flea when he got sober he went and bought a whole dog you know his own dog. <laughs> you know we you know we get when we get sober we you know we 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 
one of the greatest greatest fallacies is one of the greatest defeat things that defeats the, the, the fourth dimension is sobriety itself you know, the success of sobriety the recovery you know there's so there's so much comfort there's so much peace there are so many good things that come out of immediate sobriety when it happens. When this new thing has come to our life, what it brings into our lives is so overwhelming that it's hard to imagine working for anything better. It has built-in complacency. The program, actually, the success of the program makes us complacent. Amen. So these, these last three steps, this fourth dimension is very evasive to many people in Alcoholics Anonymous because of the success that we get out of the first nine steps. Every day is a day we must carry a vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. These thoughts must go with a constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is a proper use of the will. I love the, the book. Uh, you know, after all, remember way back in step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our life over care of God as we understood. And we went through all these steps. And we come to this point, you know, where God gives us our will back on this page. He said, I'm going to give you your will back. And he tells us how to apply it. He says, you can exercise your willpower. You know, you can exercise your willpower here all you want. And I think, you know, this is a, this is a proper use of the will. Uh, if we work at this constantly and we, we, we should this is one area that uh, you know our spiritual life our spiritual development this is where we should exercise our will along that line we should work at that constantly each day because we really see that this is the foundation of our life now you know I love uh, I love the preciseness of how the book is written I always notice this each time I go through the book, I think, see, what well, Bill gives us, the book right here, Bill said, I'm going to give them their will back on page 85 after all this work. <laughs> but it's so precise and so beautifully written. He gives us our will back on 85, but he gives us our sanity back on 84. You know, it would be dangerous to get your <laughs> will back before you got your sanity. <laughs> so, now that we have worked these steps, we have worked the spiritual step, worked on our minds, our relationship to other people. And over here we have started 10, which is uh, actually working in all three of these areas for a period of time. In step three, as we begin, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives with care of God. And then through working to these steps, four, five, six, and seven, eight, and nine, and even 10, we worked on these circles. We worked on clearing away the things that blocked us off and God has become into our lives. So this thing is, now we come to step 11. And actually this is the bridge. These, these two steps are the, are the real uh, pillars of the bridge. And it's all in step three, we've made a decision to turn over our will in steps four, five, six, and seven, eight, and nine, we cleared away the things, and even ten, we cleared away the things that blocked us from God. And if we have worked the first ten steps, they can bring us to the real power of the whole program, which is step 11. The decision and the action was all about finding God. Now, we have a two. We have been given these ten steps has given us a two. Through prayer and meditation, we can now receive God's directions into our life. So the whole thing is based on the turning over the directions, and eleven is now the receiving of his direction. The changing of directions in human life. The turning over of our directions, the clearing out with the other steps, and now we can receive God's directions. And if we have worked these ten steps, it brings us to the ultimate two as we learn to apply that step in our lives through prayer and meditation, 
And step 11, we receive God's directions in our life. And next week, we'll go into step 11.